And now the last part of the class today. In the last part, I'm gonna talk about giving you some wrap up ideas about what could be helpful for you as a uh, as a kind of young scientist to be a successful cognitive neuroscientist. And these are something like ten uh, pieces of small advice from my side that I think it would be helpful for you if you consider them for the future of your career. So that would be the last part of the, the class today. Okay, first of all, I highly recommend you to consider being skillful in three major areas. You need to have a really good conceptual skill. I mean, what we have tried to do in this course, we have tried to improve your conceptual skills, trying to understand different, different concepts during the course. Meanwhile, we highly recommend you to consider communication skills, kind of presenting what you are doing during this class, providing homeworks, communicating with the course instructors and your colleagues. All those communication skills are critically important for your success. And finally, your computational skills. You need to improve your computational skills. You need to work with data. You cannot be a good scientist without being able to be hands-on in using the databases that you have. You need to work on the databases. You need to be able to work with the data that you have. Otherwise, you cannot be a scientist. You need to, there are people who are avoiding using data. I mean, that is, that is, that is crazy. You need to work with data. You need to be able to see your data. You need to be able to explore your data. If you are just using others to, to explore your data and give you some nice figures, it is not going to work for you. If you want to be a scientist, you need to, to be able to work with data. I think that during the course, we have discussed about different neuroimaging pathways, different neuroimaging tasks, different beauties of doing neuroimaging. But I want to mention that for being a good, good cognitive neuroscientist, I think that you need to also clearly know about behavioral paradigms, computerized tasks, delayed discounting, Iowa gambling tasks, all behavioral paradigms, go, no, go, stop, signal. And I think that they are as valuable as neuroimaging measures, as all those sophisticated, beautiful, colorful maps. So you need to be able to work with these behavioral paradigms and having a good understanding about them. So you can explore, the, for example, the, the Paul Drock paper that I showed you in terms of all the self-reports and behavioral paradigms that they had used for their study, for the response inhibition study. You can just go into the supplement, supplementary part of their, their paper and just see how many of those behavioral tasks you know and then try to extend your, your expertise in terms of uh, understanding those behavioral paradigms that are being used in, in human subjects and, and extend your skill. If you want to be a good cognitive neuroscientist, you also need to have a good understanding about these behavioral paradigms that sometimes are being ignored within the cognitive neuroscience community. The third issue is being careful about what we call reverse inferencing. What is reverse inferencing? This is what we do in cognitive neuroscience. We give people a task. They, they try to work on that task. There would be a bold activation, bold response and there would be an activation map. So this is what we do in cognitive neuroscience, okay? So we say that, okay, doing this task would be kind of represented in the brain as this activation. Reverse inferencing is seeing this mask or this map or this activation and then saying that, okay, if there is this activation, so this guy is doing this task, is doing this specific kind of cognitive processes, is doing this specific kind of paradigm. And this could be problematic. It is really complex to say when we have an activation in anterior cingulate cortex, what is really happening in subject's mind or what are the processes that are, that are involved. Because they're, especially for areas that they have multiple functions. So reverse inferencing is something that is, is, you need to be really careful about that in terms of how when, when you have a specific activations in some specific parts of the brain, 
what do they really mean and how they could give you an idea about let's say reading the minds based on the activations that you have without knowing about the context of the task or, or the, the the environment that the subjects were inside so you need to be really careful about not doing reverse inferencing there are specific parts of the brain that uh, it is much more doable to have a level of reverse inferencing but you need to you always need to be really careful about reverse inferencing and sometimes of the neuroscience hypes i mean people are excited about things that they have and they just make some specific let's say they have some activation and they just make many out of that saying that okay this activation means this and that and i mean these uh, kind of conclusions are most of the time not really right so you need to be really careful about these types of conclusions as we have discussed before if you want to be successful you need to have a network of collaborators you need to have a network of mentors colleagues those who are connected with you i'm not sure how much you have been successful during the last couple of years making a good relationships with, with, with your net mentors with your colleagues with your friends so and I have seen that people are, there are people who are really good at, uh, on that. So, for example, when I write a paper, I receive emails from uh, students that they basically, they read they, my paper and they just, let's say, ask a, a small question or just contact me in terms of they enjoy the paper. So, I realize that uh, they, they want to, 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 to make some contacts so we start to kind of know each other. And then over the time, I I can see that they are, uh, extending their network of those who know them and how they are interacting and asking questions and building up relationships. It is critically important for you to go ahead and try to build up relationships with others. And it's not just about just building up relationships. It's also about keeping the relationships. During, I mean, we, we are right now in the Thanksgiving holiday here in U.S. I took advantage of the Thanksgiving holiday to send emails to my former supervisors and thank them because of whatever they have done for me so i took this opportunity to to consider and just contact my my former supervisors that are, i mean i do not have anything to do with them right now they, i mean i'm in my own scientific career path where I'm, I'm not kind of dependent on, on whatever they are doing but i still keep the connections because even kind of from the ethical and moral perspective i just feel that if i do this that would be the way that my students would do with me. And that, that is the way that we like to do in, in academia. We like to have the connections in the right way and be respectful to those who have been uh, kind of providing us with all those kind of opportunities to, to grow. And it's true about neuroscience community. I highly recommend you to be active in the neuroscience community. Take positions in the neuroscience community. Do reviews to see, to learn from others. Join, join different meetings, try to uh, uh, participate in congresses, in, in whatever scientific community is providing, try to be a part of that, try to follow people in, in Twitter, try to be active in, in the community. That is something that would definitely contribute to the level of success that you will have in this field. We have developed different networks during the last couple of years. And uh, as you have seen in our channel, uh, those who would get certified in this course, uh, we definitely would be happy to have them in these networks as we have some executive teams, we have some scientific communities and uh, committees here. We definitely would be happy to, to have you in our weekly meetings that we have. Just ask us and let us know that you have been certified and now we definitely would be happy to have your activities in these networks. And I mean, people from countries around the world are joining us in these networks and we definitely would like to have you on those networks and the scientific and executive teams on, on those those networks. I, I really love to see your faces among the faces that we have. For example, this is the, the Enigma Akri network that we have here and uh, of course we really like to have you as active members in, in these communities. Okay. Meanwhile, I want to mention that, I mean, whatever we, I have discussed today about uh, during the course, people might just get 
just feel that I mean it's too much complex. It's too much complex for me to understand, and just to get overwhelmed with the complexity and many dimensions of what we have in cognitive neuroscience. But it is not true. I mean, you you would learn that eventually over time, and that is the beauty of neuroscience. That I mean, there are always new things for you to learn, and that is that is amazing. There are scientific fields that I mean they, are, they do not have that level of dynamic progress or the level of complexity but that is that is not true for, for neuroscience you can learn wherever you go in whatever talk you, you attend and that is that is the beauty of this field I'm, I've always been amazed of learning new things going to new, new conferences and that is the it's something like kind of uh, just swimming in in a in a in an ocean it's a beautiful ocean meanwhile you need to be careful not to get overwhelmed with the complexities you 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 would just eventually kind of realize how to navigate in this this complex field you can start from simpler steps and, and move forward for that as i've mentioned before it's always good to learn in a problem oriented learning process so what i'm planning to do after this this course we are thinking about running another course specifically on one question and a neuroimaging database and exploring that question within that neuroimaging database through the entire course and doing that analysis in different levels week by week and walking you through this analytic process and also scientific inquiry and finding specific connections based on the questions that we have and trying to learn in the problem oriented learning and that is the reason i usually kind of suggest those master students master degree students or, or phd students to start their scientific inquiry and scientific questions from the early days of their, their PhD program to be able to learn based on the problem that they have for their PhD thesis or master degree thesis project and try to gather information around the question that they have and that is the best way of learning cognitive neuroscience when you have a specific question and you try to learn around that, that question. It's critically important for you to have a publication record and records of your activities. So whenever you do a project, I highly recommend you, even if you have just a protocol for a project, just put that protocol outside and let others to see whatever you are doing. So try to be as visible as possible, to be as transparent as possible. So whatever you are doing, whatever protocol, whatever research you are doing, or whatever scientific inquiry you are doing, just try to share it with others and put it in different platforms. Right now, there are different platforms available like BioArchive, MedArchive, OSF, Sarkar. Whatever you have, you can find somewhere that you can publish that. You can share it with others. And that is going to be critically important for you to be successful in this field. Because if I'm going to recruit a PhD student, if I can find that that PhD student was doing this research something like five years ago and they have registered that in a Sarkar archive platform and there is a record of the pathway that they have done or even when I'm reviewing a paper if I see that people have done that have started that five years ago and five years ago they registered that in OSF and there is a record that they have done these these steps through the time then I have a higher level of let's say confidence that this project has been done with a good quality from the first day so it is critically important for you to make a clear pathway of what you have you have done people in, in cognitive neuroscience sometimes just try to avoid two extreme sides of biology and mathematics but if you want to be a good cognitive neuroscientist you need to learn biological aspects in terms of the molecular cellular neuroscience and you need to also learn mathematics and and try to extend your computational skills so try to have these two sides as well involved not to try to avoid them if you have those two aspects of, of cognitive neuroscience then your chance to be an influential figure in the future would be much more higher and the last point I think that if you want to be successful first of all you need to have a story this is exactly what I asked you in the first step of this, this class today. I ask you to give me an idea about what you want to be in 10 years, what you want to be in the next 20 years. It is, you need to have a story for your life. You need to have a story for your future. Without that, 
story, the story that is just inspiring you. When you think about, okay, if it is gonna, this is gonna be something that is gonna be happening for me, that is inspiring enough for me to invest my entire life for that. So that is what I'm asking you to do in terms of making and developing a story for your scientific career. Try to be really, really sophisticated in at least one, two, three assessment tools. So, for example, when you talk about fMRI and resting state fMRI and uh, frontoparietal connectivity, try to be really sophisticated in one assessment tool as much as you can to know all the technical details about that. To, to try to at least have one tool that you really know in, in, tech, in, in details. And then try to have one interventional tool as well. So you need to have one intervention. The intervention could be a cognitive intervention, a behavioral intervention, a brain stimulation intervention, a pharmacological intervention, whatever the intervention is. Having an intervention in your toolbox would help you to be more successful in the field of cognitive neuroscience and be easily funded by, by different, different organizations. And also, I highly recommend people to, to have a focus in one clinical population. For example, I decided I was interested to decision making process and I decided to go and just be focused to substance use disorder because I realized that I can explore all the questions that they had for, for decision making among substance users. So I've been focused to substance disorder in my entire scientific life during the last 20 years. And that was really important for me for my, my, my scientific success. So if you want to be successful, try to be focused and try to be focused. I highly recommend you to be focused in one clinical population. Then you can develop the skills over that clinical population. And especially when you work with a clinical population, you can always find a granting agency who would be interested to that specific clinical population to fund your projects. Because without funding, it would be really hard to move forward. And without having a clinical focus and with an intervention, with a good qualified uh, kind of uh, assessment tool, it would be really hard to get funded in long term. Okay, that was my uh, kind of list of recommendations. I just wanted to add uh, two last slides. This is a, a poster that was happening, uh, about an event that was happening exactly something like uh, 13 years ago. 25th of November 2007. It was about neuroimaging. And you can imagine that there are some specific messages in this poster. First of all, it is not just something like that you do in one year or two years. It is a kind of a long-term journey that you develop these skills over time, step by step, step by step. You, you just increase your capacities over time, and you have time to just grow in the field. The other thing that I think is critically important is, as you can see here, Alan Evans is a physicist. He's from the physics side. Dr. Robian was from the field of biophysics. Hamid from computer science. Reza from electrical engineering. Aryan is a psychiatrist right now. Hajir is a neurologist. Embran psychiatrist. Azarach psychiatrist. Homayun radiologist. Maryam neurologist. Hamid neuroscientist. So you can see people from wide range of different disciplines working together, and you need to work in a teamwork. You need to know how to to interact and, and, and collaborate with these people and how to bring all these different com kind of networks and, and collaborators to this project. So this is the way that you can be successful in this field. And finally, do not forget that whatever we are talking about, if you can have a metacognition for yourself and trying to use whatever implications that we have been discussing about today in your daily life. That is going to be an, an interesting and an exciting personal journey that you can learn from, from neuroscience. And I highly recommend you to consider that in terms of increasing your personal metacognition understanding and learn whatever you have learned in this class for your personal 
benefit and for your personal change. And that is going to be a, kind of a really, really important gain that you can have from cognitive neuroscience. And that would be the, the big gift of cognitive neuroscience that I've never seen in any other field of, of science, that you can use whatever you learn from cognitive neuroscience to change yourself, to understand what is happening inside yourself, and trying to understand yourself to be able to help others. And that is, that is the beauty of cognitive neuroscience. That's it. Thank you very much. It was a real long <laughs> day today, but I hope that you kind of have a, a better idea what we can do in this field. And uh, I'm gonna kind of say goodbye right now. Mm -hmm.